once again to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you're, uh, that you're comfortable, that you're ready for a deep shock, because I'm going to make the connection between Osama bin Laden and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and his son, George W. Bush. So uh, you might want to listen very, very carefully. And I guarantee you, you're going to be amazed, you're going to wake up, you're going to be shocked, you're going to be angry, and then some things are going to begin to make a whole lot of sense that never made any sense before. That's the father of the current president, who was our president at another point in our recent history, was deeply involved in the fiasco at the Bay of Pigs. Now, all of this stuff is on record. It's been published in many, many books and reports and uh, articles, uh, you know, for years. So you're going to have to go and look that up. Some of it can be researched on our website uh, there are some stories at the end of the uh, the one that we have on our exclusives page entitled America's New War. If you click on every single one of those links at the end of that story and read all of the text within those stories on uh, in separate newspapers and news services and websites, you will begin to pick up the web and you will be referred to uh, other links and sources uh, so that you can verify all of this material for yourself. We've given that to you. In my book, Behold a Pale Horse, you can see some of the history of President George Herbert Walker Bush in connection with the Central Intelligence Agency, the drugs in the Golden Triangle, the connection between the Iran-Contra affair, drugs, Oliver North, Admiral Poindexter, and a whole bunch of other things, and that tremendous financial conglomerate known as Bank of Credit and Commerce International, otherwise known to researchers as BCCI. The Central Intelligence Agency, under George Herbert Walker Bush, and later under Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush, and even later under President George Herbert Walker Bush assisted the Afghani freedom fighters in Afghanistan against the invasion and occupation of their country by the Soviet Union. In order to create the element that was needed to bind the various Islamic sex groups um, and, and different tribal uh, affiliations, under one concerted cause to fight the Soviet Union, the Central Intelligence Agency corrupted the religion of Islam and taught this corrupted version to special leaders that they recruited in order 
to teach it to others in cooperation with the Pakistani SIS. That's their secret intelligence service. A lot of these schools and a lot of this instruction was conducted within the borders of Pakistan and in Afghanistan by operatives of the Central Intelligence Agency from America's SEAL teams and special forces sent to Afghanistan by the Special Operations Division of the Department of Defense, also known as the Special Operations Group, or SOG. All of this, too, is a matter of record. A friend and business partner of the Bush family for many years, the senior bin Laden, sent his son to help in this effort. The younger Osama bin Laden was recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency, trained by them as one of these special leaders to teach the corrupted version of Islam, the corrupted version that convinced all of these young, hot-blooded Muslims that they should participate in a specific jihad or holy war against the Soviet Union. Arms were furnished by the Central Intelligence Agency and there were advisors from the United States of America with these people as they fought the war against the Soviets for all of those years. Now for that as a background and most of it already published and in the public domain in many different books and many different papers, many different reports has come out in Senate and House investigating committees during their questioning. Um, a lot of it came out during the so-called Iran-Contra affair and, uh, and, and in a whole lot of other investigations in and out of government. Most of you already know these things. Those of you who don't, you're going to have to spend some time reading, researching, and catching up. Tonight, I'm going to give you some information that I have independently confirmed through my own research, and others have also independently confirmed in their own research, and you will find in various reports and documents and books, much of which can be found on the Internet. Tonight, I'm going to quote to you from a book entitled, Fortunate Son, written by J.H. Hatfield, J.H. Hatfield. When this book was first published, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, copies extant are already out to the public sector were rounded up somewhat mysteriously. The publisher withdrew their support of the book. The plates used for printing the book were smashed, and the book was, uh, the way they say it in the publishing business, put up on the shelf. I'm going to begin quoting from a chapter entitled Ties That Bind, beginning on page 54, second to the last paragraph. George W.'s early days, or early years, in Midland, Texas, coincided with heady days for West Texas, touched off by the 1973 Arab oil embargo, as the price of crude eventually soared to more than $30 a barrel and the economists predicted it would go even higher. The junior Bush desperately wanted a bigger piece of the action to strike it rich like his father did years earlier, but without using any of his own money. In June 1977, he formed his own drilling company, Arbusto Energy. Arbusto in Spanish means Bush. Like his father, who made his fortune in the oil business with the money of others, George W. founded Arbusto with the financial backing of investors including James R. Bath, B-A-T-H, a Houston businessman whom Bush apparently first met when they were in the same Texas Air National Guard unit. Tax documents and personal financial records in the public sector show that Bath, an aircraft broker with business ties to Saudi Arabia sheiks, had invested $50,000 in Arbusto, granting him a 5% interest in two limited partnerships which were controlled by Bush. In one of the most bizarre footnotes to history, Time magazine described Bath in 1991 as a deal broker whose alleged associations run from the Central Intelligence Agency 
to a major shareholder and director of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, also known as BCCI, as it was more commonly known. It was closed down in July 1991 amid charges of multi-billion dollar fraud and worldwide news reports that the institution had been involved in covert intelligence work, drug money laundering, arms brokering, bribery of government officials, and aid to terrorists. And I can tell you that's all true. An accounting commissioned by the Bank of England finally exposed the extent of BCCI's deficits and criminal offenses, forcing the bank's eventual collapse. Bath was never directly implicated in the BCCI scandal. But according to the Outlaw Bank, an award-winning 1993 book by Time correspondents Jonathan Beatty and S.C. Gwynn, Bath originally made his fortune by investing money for Sheikh Khalid bin. That's Sheikh Khalid bin, Mahfouz, and another BCCI-connected Saudi, Sheikh bin Laden. Allegedly, and he absolutely is, it's not allegedly, allegedly at all, the father of none other than Osama bin Laden. The man accused by the U.S. government of masterminding the August 1998 terrorist bombings of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, which killed more than 250 people, and now the mastermind of the attacks upon the Pentagon and the North and South Towers of the World Trade Center buildings in New York City. According to news reports, in a 1976 trust agreement drawn shortly after Bush's father was appointed director of the Central Intelligence Agency, now listen closely, Saudi Sheikh Salam M. Bin Laden appointed Bath as his business representative in Texas. Bin Laden, along with his brothers, owned Bin Laden Brothers Construction, one of the largest construction companies in the Middle East. In a 1991 deposition, Bath testi testified he was the sole director of Skyway Aircraft Leasing Limited, a Houston company owned by Khaled bin Mahfouz. Bin Mahfouz had been a major shareholder in the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which had been accused of using Mideast oil money to seek ties to political leaders in other countries throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. According to court documents that are on public record, Bath also swore that in 1977 he represented four prominent and wealthy Saudi Arabians as a trustee and used his name on their investments in the United States. In return, he received a 5% interest in their deals. Federal authorities, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and the FBI, later investigated Bath after allegations. Network and the FBI later investigated Bath after allegations were made by one of his American business partners that the Saudis were using Bath and their enormous financial sources to influence United States policy. Time reporters Beattie and Gwen suggest in their book that the $50,000 Bath invested in George W.'s Arbusto Energy Drilling Company may have belonged to Bath's Saudi client since the Houston businessman had no money of his own at the time. The truth is, the only source of his investment money was from the Saudi investors whose names I have already quoted to you. Ironically, the money used to underwrite the first business venture of a possible future president of the United States may have been derived at least in part from the family fortune of Saudi terrorist Osama bin Laden. 
In 1990, in an attempt to distance himself and his presidential father from the growing BCCI scandal, George W. Bush stated in an interview that neither he nor the elder Bush had ever conducted business with James Bath. It was a bold-faced lie. Junior went on record at the time as saying that he met the Houston businessman in 1970 when both were fighter pilots at the Air National Guard base at Ellington Air Force Base. President Bush, quote, knows Bath the way he knows thousands of people, end quote, his son told the press. And the two men could not be considered good friends. Another bold-faced lie. Quote, I've never done business with him, and I know the president hasn't either, end quote, another bold-faced lie. Because, ladies and gentlemen, a few months later, the release of tax documents and personal financial records into the public sector forced George W. Bush to admit that Bath had indeed been one of our Busto Energy's original investors. Bush, Bush said that to his knowledge, Bath's investment was from personal funds and no available evidence existed to determine that the money came from Saudi interests except for the fact that no personal funds of that magnitude could ever, ever be located or ever be found on record to have belonged to Mr. Bath. A lot of questions remain unanswered as to Bath's motives behind his investment in George W.'s first business venture. But in light of the record of George W.'s father, George Herbert Walker Bush, his involvement with the recruiting and training of Osama bin Laden, his friendship with the bin Laden family and many other wealthy and well-placed Saudi Arabians in the Middle East, his involvement, his deep involvement in the oil industry, both in the United States and in the Middle East, and his involvement with the Central Intelligence Agency has convinced an awful lot of people that that whole financial enterprise to be able to invest money into George W.'s fledgling business was not only influenced, but probably set up through the influence of his father, George Herbert Walker Bush. you just heard, not what you just heard, but I know many of you have been looking into these things for many years, have, uh, have actually been involved in some of the research that is disclosed, some of the things that I've just revealed to you over this broadcast. You've also heard some of it over other broadcasts, on videotapes, on special television reports, on such things as the... Uh, Freedom of Speech Network. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, uh, uh, Bill. Yeah. i tell you what. I'm not surprised. I kept telling everybody where I worked at but during the election that Bush was hooked up in that BCCI. Oh, absolutely. His father he, was. Jordan. Oh, yeah. They filed bankruptcy down there. That, that, that's a, that, them guys are in that stuff. 
And I'll tell you what, I'd like to have a copy of that information you just put out. Well, you How do. can I get it and what i got to do to get it? Go order the book. It's called Fortunate Son by J.H. Hatfield. Let me, let me write this down. I'm excited about it. It's, it's a biography of George W. Bush, and it is full of facts. There's only one part of this book that I'm going to caution you against. And that's the part at the end where he uses anonymous sources whom he does not name so that you cannot check on any of it uh, to claim that Bush was uh, was a habitual uh, cocaine user. Uh-huh. But, hey, Bill, it, the, the good Lord just brought it to my attention. About two weeks ago, somebody died who wrote a biography, committed suicide. Is this that guy? I have no idea. I haven't heard about him. Oh, well, you, well, Bill, check it out. I heard it one day while I was cutting grass, but I said, man, that's, that's very interesting. This guy committed suicide. It's a suicide. Now, I don't know who it was. It, it, somebody wrote a biography on this man, and now he's dead. He hasn't been dead no more than, I would say, about three to four weeks. Well, most, Bill. Uh, unless you can tell who it was that committed suicide and where you saw it at, it's just rumor, isn't it? Well, if you want to call it rumor, but it's going to come out, and when it comes out, well, then I'm going to let you know, because I'm not exaggerating. I heard it on a regular radio station, not a shortwave station. They gave it right over. I just wish I remembered the guy that wrote the biography. It was him that wrote the story about one of the Bushes. He died. That much I do know. I didn't make no mistake hearing about it. Okay. But if you want to count it as a rumor, that's all right. Unless you can tell us the name of the person and the source from which you got the information, it is a rumor. That's the definition of a rumor. Okay. Now, now the name of this book again is? Fortunate Son. Fortunate Son by? J.H. Hatfield. And I can, and I can go uh, get it at a book steal, bookstore. Uh, I don't know where you can get it. Okay. I know if you look for it, it's in print, you can find it. I'm going to try to find it. I'm not surprised at all, Bill. I knew about that BCCI. I kept telling people at work about that. I said, I said between Bush and Gore, they're, like George Wallace said years ago, not a dime's worth of difference. What? But a dime's worth of You're difference. You're right about that, except it shrank to a nickel. <laughs> all right. Nice talking to you, brother. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. 520-333-4578. Phones are open. Good evening, you're on the air. Oh, how are you doing, Bill? Good. Yeah, um, as an addendum to your research, I think what is interesting is that um, why Bush is so close to Putin is that uh, his great-grandfather, um, George Herbert Walker, um, was one of the people that helped um, finance the Bolsheviks through the uh, corporation, the American International Corporation, which I think is an interesting footnote. But I just want to thank you for your uh, great re- research on this um, particular um <clears throat> You know, problem. I think um, you know we hear in the media on CNN, you know, on the Communist News Networks and uh, NBC and some of these other uh, you know um, <clears throat> media outlets. Um, you know, we just hear that uh, you know Ben Laden is the uh, main suspect and everything, and we don't get the full picture. You know, and I think that you know you close in in terms of like what's really going on. Don't you think it's funny that they've been looking for him for so many years, could never find him? Now yeah. all now all of a sudden they're accusing him of blowing up the. The, the uh, Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, and the, the Pentagon, and now they claim that they know exactly where he is. They're following him by satellite. Now, how did that happen? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and all these journalists, you know, going over there to uh, interview him and stuff, and it's like they don't know where he is, but the journalists can find him, but the CIA can't. Yeah, and supposedly Timothy McVeigh could, too. Sure. <laughs> or Terry Nichols. Right. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. You're welcome. Bye. And and I got news for you guys. I've you know read quite a bit about Terry Nichols and studied him in our investigation. And uh, Terry Nichols probably couldn't find his own rear end, uh, you know, in a dark tent at high noon. Good evening. You're on the air. How you doing, Mr. Cooper? Good. Um, I have a question. They're going to uh, have a war on terrorism. Um, That's what they say. I'm, but I'm, if it's anything like the war on drugs, it's really a war on the Bill of Rights. Yeah, I was wondering, who are they going to define as a terrorist? Probably me. See, that's what I'm worried. I'm Because <laughs> they're calling up, what, 35,000 reservists for homeland defense. 50,000. 50, yeah, 50,000 for homeland defense. And I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah, what does it mean? Who are they going to defend against? Yeah. I mean, they've already admitted that uh, you, you you can't uh, they can't keep track of terrorists and you can't stop a terrorist attack if they're really committed to making the attack. 
all you can do is track them down afterwards and uh, you know terrorize them or, or the people that, uh, that where they live or something. And I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I I'm just worried that in all this uh, hysteria that's been created, that uh, folks like us are going to get lumped together <laughs> with. Uh, you know, Mid Eastern folks, and uh, we're going to be uh, taken away to uh, God knows where. I told you that years ago. Why is everybody so shocked when they see it hap starting to happen? Yeah, I, I was listening to another talk show, and this guy claims that within a week or two, that they're going to round up somewhere around a hundred thousand folks. Now, this I this guy didn't get. He just he wouldn't name his source, so it's a rumor. Well, not only is it a rumor, but he's probably dead wrong. Yeah. They probably will get around to doing it, but nobody knows when. Uh, but I guarantee it's not going to be in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thanks a lot, Mr. Cooper. You're welcome. Five two zero three 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 four five seven. That was probably Alex Jones. <laughs> Good evening, you're on the air. Hi, Mr. Cooper. I've listened to you for quite a few years. I'm Joe in West Virginia. Hi, Joe. I'm really impressed with the research that you do, and tonight you've startled me. Because for many years, I had respected Clark Clifford, and I think that he was involved with that BCCI. He was heavily involved with BCC, uh, BCCI and, uh, and uh, was, was, uh, had a seat on the board of directors. Yeah, and I, I think that he was about to be indicted, and they decided that due to his ill health, they wouldn't proceed with the indictment. Yep, you're right. And, and I, I, I'm kind of foggy about that, but I, I thought maybe you would uh, be able to... Uh, tell me more about how Clark Clifford fits into all that. Yeah, he had a seat on the board of directors of BCCI. He was one of the directors. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number, and it's your turn to call. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. Yeah. It's Monty from Radio Free Vermont. Hi, Monty. Hi there. Um, I was just looking up uh, Mr. Hatfield on the internet. And I noticed it's on the Barnes and Noble website, and that means his book is sold by Barnes and Noble. Right, and it was updated for after the 2001 uh, election cycle. Mm -hmm. And there's also a note here, um, an annotation, a statement from the publisher, uh, dated July 23rd of 2001, which clarifies the, the previous call you had uh, about the suicide. Uh huh. Can I read you a quick paragraph? If it's about that so-called suicide, yeah, go ahead. Okay, it says, quote, We have been reeling from the news since Friday. Jim Hatfield is gone. In a country where not enough reporters and talking heads have the courage to speak truth to power, Hatfield, the president's most controversial biographer, ended his own life in solitude in an Arkansas motel last week. Let me uh, assure you, but I have spoken on many occasions with Mr. Hatfield uh, in previous years because of his research and mine paralleling each other uh, quite a bit. Uh, and Mr. Hatfield would not have committed suicide under any circumstances. If he's dead, somebody murdered him. And I am just absolutely astounded that because of the publicity given his book when it first came out and the fact that it was removed from the shelves almost immediately, um, and, and taken out of circulation that his death was not uh, um, announced on the major news and, think, it, and it wasn't I think if I recall I remember seeing like a brief <coughs> snippet about it like a, a brief UPI wire re book that Bush camp successfully stifled when it was first published in 99 oh yeah they pulled it right off the shelves almost yeah. as soon as it got on the shelves it was pulled yeah, it says in here that the and all the copies were were stacked in a pile and burned. It's not surprising. It says the Bush's campaign lawyers went out of their way to personally discredit the author without necessarily denying any of the book's factual details. They never denied anything ever. Well, it's just like your book. They go out of their way to discredit you without denying any of the details. Well, they attack my character. They call me a drunk and a and a liar and a. A uh, bank robber and a child molester and a white supremacist and uh, uh, everything in the world, but they never ever have refuted one thing that I've ever published that I published in my book or that I put out on this radio broadcast. I would agree. <coughs> so, but anyway, I just wanted to add that in. Thank and you. 
We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Monty. Never, no problem. Well, you you heard it, folks. And I'm telling you right now, uh, Mr. Hatfield did not commit suicide. If he's dead, he was murdered. Good evening. You're on the air. You better watch out, or uh, Georgie Jr. is going to call you the most dangerous talk host in America. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> then I could put two notches on my gun. <laughs> or, on my, or on my microphone, I should say. And unfortunately, that's all the things I can add to the conversation, so I'll hang up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. Taking your calls till the end of the hour. Good evening, you're on the air. Hello, Bill. Matt from Connecticut. Hi, Matt. Um, I know someone who works for a major book chain where Fortunate Son is a bargain book, and you could probably still find it. Where? Borders Books and Music. Borders Books and Music. You heard it, oh, folks. For a fact, I've seen it uh, two months ago. Yep. Go get it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Go get it. It starts when George W. was, in fact, starts before he was born and goes right up to the when he went to the White House. Yep. And you know what? They weren't they weren't <laughs> selling too hot, from what I heard. They were out there, but uh, people weren't buying them. Well, that's too bad, because when they first came out, before they were snatched off the shelf and put in a pile and burned, uh, they were, uh, well, it was number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. Well, what, what happens is with these major... Um, no, people get scared. Once once a book is vilified like that, and they know that somebody doesn't want you to read it, they won't. Sure. They're scared. What happens, though, sometimes is when they have a lot of these books, they will, um, they will put them as a bargain title, and they'll sell them by the pallet, and a lot of times they'll slip through. And uh, I know uh, this guy had a ton of them. Good. Maybe and, he'll sell uh, them all. I can give you another title, too. I don't know. Perhaps you've uh, seen this book um, regarding uh, Osama bin Laden and Afghanistan. Unholy <laughs> Wars by John K. Cooley. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. In fact, I have it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the subtitle is Afghanistan, America, and International Terrorism. Yeah. And uh, for the listener's benefit, it, you know, can... American people are so blind and so ignorant. It's just incredible. Sure. It's just... Sure. Bin Laden was created by the Central Intelligence yep. Agency. It was created by George Bush's father. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people don't realize that... Well, most people don't realize that these terrorist organizations, either they were created by us... Or by the Soviet Union. Or by the Soviet Union. Or by and, Cuba. Or by Great Britain. And if you know enough about the Cold War, you know that was a hoax. So, you know, ultimately, when you get to the highest levels, they're all working for the same team. Yep. And uh, it deals, this book, uh, Unholy Wars, deals with BCCI. It deals with the... Um, you can also read an awful lot about BCCI and, and George Herbert Walker Bush in my book. Behold a pale horse. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I picked that one up about ten years ago, and I read it about five times. So I'm very familiar with that. But this book, I just uh, my mother before she passed away, God bless her soul, she had found this mo this book at a tag sale, and uh, gave it to me because she knew that you know I would find it yeah. interesting. And okay, well, thank behold. thanks for calling. You're welcome. Good night. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight. Good evening. You're on the air. Hey, Bill, this Lamb down the road here. Hi. Uh, Prescott Bush uh, was sent uh, to, to uh, Iraq in the uh, nineteen in uh, uh, nineteen eighteen. Prescott Bush was George Herbert Walker Bush's father. That's right. Uh, they, they've been missing with Iraq for almost a hundred years now. Yep. And, uh, you know, in the 80, uh, talking about the BCCI, you know, in 88, at Homestead Air Force Base, they found a C-130 cargo plane full of cocaine. Yeah, that's true. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that, that's on public record, too. I don't know, uh, I remember seeing the pictures of it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the Bushes have been, uh, they've been over there trying to get some of that, uh, for the last, for 80 years now. Well, they've got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they got it, and we're getting it. And they're going to get a lot more, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, man. Well, uh, Price of oil is already going up. That's right. And uh, we're going to pay for it, too, but. Yep. All right, good talking to you. Thanks for calling. Bye. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight. Good evening. You're on the air. Hey, Mr. Cooper. How you doing? I'm listening to your show, and I uh, appreciate this. Uh, 
just went out to the website, barnesandnoble.com, and I'm um, able to order the book, Fortunate Son, George W. Bush, and the Making of an American President, in stock, J.H. Hatfield, paperback. That's it. Our price, fourteen ninety five. so the book is out there for your listeners. Second question I have. I noticed that ever since uh, the two towers went down and the unfortunate loss of all those lives over there, that the U.N. during the Gulf War came out with so many resolutions condemning... Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, and we haven't heard a peep out of them as far as any resolutions like condemning or, you know, from the Joint Security Council, that type of thing. I was wondering what your opinion is on that. What, what, what difference does it make who they condemn? You know, you can listen to what they say so you get purple in the face and die. It's what they do that matters, and they don't ever do anything. Now, here's the kicker. I came in tonight after a hard day's work, and I put on Channel 2 News, and there is one of the talking heads on uh, CBS talking about how unprepared we are for an anthrax attack. And I'm like, well, you know, They're just I mean, trying to... the military, I mean, the last thing you tell the peer populace is that, you know, how vulnerable you are to another attack. Unless you want them to get all scared and weepy and, you know, wimpy and, uh, exactly. and, and pulling the covers up over their head at night so that they will accept any... Draconian, uh, tyrannical, uh, despotic measures that you want to impose upon them in the name of their own security. And for my wrestling fans, I you know for, you know forgive me for saying this, but <coughs> a lot of people in this country are saying, well, maybe we shouldn't watch them tomahawks, and maybe we shouldn't go in there because there might be a suitcase of God knows what coming back in this country. I mean, it's talk talk about mind conditioning. Yeah, it's unbelievable what's and, going on. And so what? So what if there is? Would you rather be free and have a chance to live a good life and be able to deal with things, or would you rather have them scare you into enslaving your own self and living your whole life in in fear as a slave? The thing that frightens me, sir, is that it seems to be working. Working rather. Well, okay. I've always because they put that onto the boot tube, and these people are like, whoa, let's pull these flags back in. Uh, well, maybe we don't want to attack these countries. Well, you know, maybe the backlash. Let's go back to Nintendo and all that other stuff. I mean, like, you know, they've got us, like, you know, hearts and minds. I think we absolutely should identify who did this, and we should identify who financed them, and we should identify who helped them and trained them, and we should identify which political uh, process has, uh, has encouraged them, and we should go in and get these people, bring them back, and... Try them in a court of law, and if they're found guilty, uh, you know, let them be sentenced to whatever they're sentenced to. Correct. And my mindset is follow the money. You know, it's the money end of it. I mean, like people are short selling stocks. They believe that it was the, uh, you know, the uh, terrorist networks short selling. Yeah, it's always they believe instead of who did it. I'll tell you what, if somebody was short selling stocks, their name is on record. How right. come they're not telling us who it was? Exactly. How come nobody is screaming, hey, tell us these names. Don't tell us that somebody was doing it and maybe Osama bin Laden made a lot of money. Tell us exactly who it was because you know exactly who it was. Well, I don't think it was Phil Cole and the stockbroker up doing this whole thing saying, hey, sell. You know, he had some other agents doing it for him. Doesn't well, matter. Their names are on record. Their names are on record. They have to be. But we don't answer. We don't ask those questions. Well, most people are too stupid to even ask, you know, what street they live on, to tell you the truth. Sir, it's a pleasure, like, listening to your broadcast, and keep up the work. Thanks for calling. Adios. 5 to 0 3 3 3 4 5 7 8 7 Yeah, they know. They know exactly. You can't make a stock transaction, or your agent can't make a stock transaction without somebody knowing exactly who did it. It's on record. Good evening. You're on the air. How you doing? I'm group of Robert, Tennessee. Hi, Robert. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, just make a comment on, uh, you know, uh, this uh, New World Order crowd would have us to believe that, you know, uh, that they're after uh, Osama bin Laden, but, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, Ron Field, he was on TV tonight, this evening there, and uh, he was asked a question by one of the reporters. The reporters are asking, uh, sir, uh, if you take uh, Osama Ladeen out now would everything be over and he said he stated no that would only be the, the beginning of that no yeah, wonder why if, if Osama bin Laden is responsible how right. could that be if he's the man 
That's right. All the focus, no, the whole world is focused yeah. on uh, that's our enemy. That's the world hmm. enemy. How, how, ben so, so how can that be? If we get him and we get his network, how can that be that it wouldn't be over? That's right. So, you know, somebody say, you know, I'm just looking at this. I'm saying, hey, you know, this, our government is lying to us again. Yeah, because they have no intention of making it stop. It, yeah. it, read the report from Iron Mountain. It's all explained in there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Everybody listening, get a copy of the report from Iron Mountain. It's in there. It tells you exactly what they're doing. People don't believe in the war on drugs anymore. They're calling for the legalization of drugs. And they got a lot of political clout behind them, so they got to have a new enemy now. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening, Bill. I had to run to turn my radio off, so I didn't blast it in your face. It was across the room. Uh, it's Paul from Brooklyn. I spoke to you a, a few times uh, several years back. But um, listen, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I can't believe what, what, what I'm hearing. I, I got a, I got a couple of questions for you. Um, in in this particular crisis and everything that's going on right now, in your opinion. Do we stand behind what our government's doing? Uh, I mean, knowing knowing all of this, all this is happening, but yet knowing we're we're still in the midst of this horrific crisis. Depends upon if what they're doing is right or wrong. It is never proper to stand behind anybody if you know in your heart they're wrong. That's what Hitler's followers did, wasn't it? That's true. And didn't the Nuremberg trials prove that your responsibility? is to refuse if you know it's wrong? Absolutely, because they held German officers who were supposedly following orders. Yeah, and they executed them too, didn't they? Yes, they did. You want to be executed if, if somebody comes over here and kicks our butt and decides you're a war criminal? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. And if you think nobody can kick our butt, I'm telling you right now, there's so many atomic weapons loose in the world that that could happen very easily. Look what happened. When one plane crashed into the Pentagon and two planes crashed into the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, Washington, D.C. was in a panic. True. Nobody knew where anybody was. Everything was evacuated with no plan. I'm telling you right now, for about six hours, the government was working, but it wasn't working uh, with the people who are supposed to be working. It was working from underground command centers by people who nobody even knows anything about. Well, here's a real question that, that you definitely seem ideally suited to answer. Given the fact that now we're hearing all over the news that the Israeli Mossad supposedly warned us about all of this weeks before... And they, they did. Was, so did the Germans. So did the French. And then there was a guy in prison who actually specifically named the World Trade Center. Yeah, he made a phone I, call to the Secret Service and yeah, told so, them all about it. And, exactly. So the question that I want to ask you in response to all of that is... If the government, was the government really in shambles? Or in your opinion, they pretty much know that this was going to happen and just kind of, you know, laid back and Some waited. people in the government knew. Most people didn't have a clue just like everybody else. Amazing. But just like to... Oklahoma City, they wanted it to happen. It gives them more power. Well, I, I was, what I was going to what, what say was basically that regardless of whether or not they, quote-unquote, wanted it to happen, it definitely suits the purpose. I mean, you know, I'm, sit, I'm sitting here in Brooklyn, and I, I'm watching F-16s fly over my head while I'm, while I'm treating my, you know. Yeah, why are, why are F-16s flying over your head? Supposedly to, you know, keep the board, see, to keep New York safe no, now that all no, happened. No, it's to create the sense, it's to keep this sense of fear and urgency going. Well, right. I, I, you know, I, there's always the, there's always the. Two and, if, and if you watch CNN, you'll never sleep again. It's horrifying. It's, it's absolutely horrifying. Something else that. Um, <laughs> In fact, CNN is the one that coined the phrase "America's New War." Right. Ex yeah. Exactly. I th actually, I thought it was just that. <laughs> But uh, another thing, and now again, this is, I guess it could sort of fall under the heading of rumor, but I'll tell you anyway, because I, I, I know some people in the New York City schools. If you're going to get into rumor, forget it. We don't do that on this broadcast. Okay. I don't, um, don't even want to hear it. Say that again? I said I don't even want to hear it. Okay, no problem. Um... Anyway, keep up the good work. Thank you very much for your broadcast. And oh, one thing, uh, one thing I did want to tell you. Interestingly enough, if you get a hold, if you can get a hold of a uh, comedy tape uh, called "You Are All Diseased" by George Carlin, funny thing is, is he gives a parody of what he, a lot of what you're talking about. But he he talks about he he's, he makes a whole uh, skit about air for, uh, airplane security, airport security, and how you know they can screw with us anytime they want as long as we're with. And it, it's, oh yeah. Uh, 
George Car George Carlin is uh, he likes freedom. Yeah. A lot. And, <laughs> yeah, and he and he really comes out against a lot of this stuff. And of course, you know, everybody's laughing hysterically, and they forget about it when they go home. But but that, that's the part of that particular act that I remember because he, in a sense, made a comedy skit out of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And and it's just if you can pick up the. Um, I've heard it. I've heard it. Oh yeah. Heard it. I've, I was raised with George Carlin. He's from my generation. I've yeah. been listening to him for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. Yeah, he's absolutely, he's absolutely hilarious, and uh, you know. I, by the way, I have to. Uh, I'm going to order your book again because I lent it to somebody, and I don't think I'm getting it back. <laughs> to this person is just reading it. You better hurry because it's out of print. So, yeah, okay, definitely. But anyway, thank you again, Bill. Thanks for taking my call, and uh, God bless America, man. You're welcome. Bye. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number, and it's your turn. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill and Dave from Wisconsin. Hi, Dave. You know, I was watching that Talking Head Bush on TV the other day, and he says, uh, there's an old saying in the old Wild West, want it dead or alive, speaking about going after Bin Laden. Yeah, dead or alive. And I would now, think, what kind of justice is that? Is that the kind of justice that we do? Absolutely not. Is that what we believe in? No, we have innocent before guilty. Yeah, people, are, people are saying he's responsible, but they pre presented no one with any proof. He hasn't been tried or found guilty by anyone in any court. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't have anything to do with it. But if he did, let's go get him, bring him back, present the, the evidence, and, and if he's convicted, you know, then, then sentence him. Exactly. But uh, it's not the American way to say, hey, look at that guy down the street. I know he's the guy that burned down the school three weeks ago. Let's go kill him tonight. Because that's exactly what they're doing. Exactly. And if you want to go, if you want to go back to the old West saying, then if every if half the people on the airplanes were armed like they were in the old West, that them buildings probably would not, or them planes uh, probably would not have crashed. If those people on those planes had been allowed to carry guns, none of it would have happened. Exactly. You would have had plastic knives against people with guns. And yeah, maybe there'd be some holes in the side of the airplane, and yeah, maybe there would have been rapid decompression, and yeah, maybe somebody would have had a heart attack, but the plane would have landed safely, and uh, most of those people would still be alive, and nothing would have crashed into the World Trade Center towers or into the Pentagon. Bet on it. Bet your life on it. That's exactly, that's exactly what I was thinking. And you'll never hear the talking heads talk about that on the... No, no, of course not. But I tell you what, there's nothing stopping all of the people in this listening audience from starting to call CNN and call every talk radio show in this nation and start talking about it and calling Larry King live and, and calling all of the talk shows on television. And don't stop. I mean, do it for months and months and months and hammer it into the head. If those people on pl those planes that had guns, none of this would have happened. Exactly. Yep. I think that's a good idea. To so that's your it. challenge. Everybody in this listening audience, start doing that tonight. As soon as uh, I get off the air, every talk show that's on the radio anywhere, AM, FM, shortwave, uh, television, doesn't matter. Call. Talk about it. That's Rub it in their faces. Tell them that it is the liberal anti-gun lobby that killed all those people in the World Trade Center towers and in the Pentagon. Because that's the truth. That's exactly the truth. You're right on that. That's okay. the truth. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Five zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. You know what they're going to say then? Well, then terrorists could go on the plane with guns, and hijackers could go on the plane with guns. Yeah, they could. Two or three of them against 150 passengers with guns. <laughs> How long do you think they'd live? Good evening. You're on the air. Hey, good evening, Mr. Cooper. This is Bill in North Carolina. Um, you know, just what, what you were just talking about just now, um, I haven't heard too many people talking about this topic, although I did read an email that came through, have not found confirmation on it, but I understand that the government of Brazil has allowed this exact thing you're talking about to happen by decree, taking guns on airplanes. Well, we'll find out, but uh, it's a rumor, folks. Yeah, but uh, they just said the vote uh, in their parliament was 234 to 6. Well, so no, 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 you can't document that. Just get off the rumor. Okay, no problem. Just wanted to let you know that it's being answered about. Thank you. Folks, I'm not interested in rumors being bantered about, period. Someday you're all going to get that through your thick heads. Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, good evening. Bill Schoen from Pennsylvania. Hi. Um, Fortunate Son still available on Amazon.com. Just ordered it. Good. Uh, have you heard of Zim American Israeli Shipping? Uh, 
uh, doesn't ring a bell. Uh, uh, they're probably the largest shipping operation out of Israel. They had offices on the 16th and 17th floor of the South Building of the World Trade Center. Yeah. And up, I've got it up on the Wall Street Journal research list right now. All employees are safe. Operations have been consolidated in Norfolk, Virginia. Company moved most of its operations out of the World Trade Center one week before attack. One week before. Hmm. Mm. That's very They moved there about five or seven years ago. Huh. Hmm. Norfolk, Virginia is also a Navy yard. Guess yeah. the Mossad feels safe down there. Well, you don't know if they're connected with the Mossad. Why did you throw that in there? Why? Yeah. Because they uh, were the ones Zim bought the Liberty ship straight after World War II that was operated by the underground, the Israeli underground. But that doesn't mean that the people who are working for Zim today that were in the World Trade Center are connected with the Mossad. The chances are some of them are because the Mossad has penetrated almost every Jewish company and community in this country. That's true. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are. Well, I, I would... Well, we'll go with it as a room and won't worry about it. But anyway, that company did move out the week before the attack. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 520-333-4578 is the number. 520-333-4578 is the number. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, how you doing, Mr. Cooper? I'm up here in uh, just outside of, like, Wall Street. And I was wondering, maybe you can answer a question for me. With something like this going down, why are there warships? Sitting off the coast of New York City. I don't know. Two aircraft carriers, battleships, jets flying overhead. Here's what I think it is. I think it's to keep the level of fear and anxiety to the highest level possible. That's why I think it is. Because people I talk to say, well, they brought the ships up for comfort. I mean, I get no comfort seeing warplanes overhead. I'm waiting. Well, for how would you? Why? How would? How would anybody? I mean, send them to where they're going to do the most good. Well, no, that'd probably be in their home port, so the sailors could go home to their wives and families. Exactly. You know, but, I mean, we got jets flying overhead. I see you can no talk to this. You can talk about this till you're blue in the face. You've already said what's pertinent, and so have I. There's nothing else we can say. It's a, sp it's a spooky situation. Uh, that's exactly what, spooky. That's what it's supposed to be. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. That's my personal opinion, that they're there to keep a heightened state of fear and emergency and uh, apprehension. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. Joe from Boston. Hi, Joe. I do it. I have a. Can you give the name of the book again? Those two books that I'm going to get. And I also have a report which I heard on the news uh, that in Brazil they now allow people. They have just passed legislation. Where did you hear that? On the radio. What radio? WBZ Boston. Oh, NWRKO radio here on. Okay. Lake. They allowed now people to carry guns on Brazilian planes. Good for Brazil. Over 21. Finally got some smart people in this world. <laughs> Finally got some smart people in this world that understand what people like me and you and many others have been trying to tell them for forever. I mean, I, I don't like the idea of shooting on a plane, but if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. I'm going to tell you right now, Sarah Brady yeah. and all these anti-gun people are what killed, murdered, all of those people in the Twin Trade Center, the World Trade Center, Twin Towers, and the Pentagon, and all the passengers on those planes, because they had nothing to defend themselves with. Now we, now they want to uh, take all our uh, knives away on planes, and they want to wiretap and everything. Can you give the name of those two books again? I I'll give them. you the name of the one I got in front of me: Fortunate Son by J. H. Hatfield. Great, and I'd like to comment on that all those stupid uh, security measures they're having. Now we can't park near the airport anymore. What's, I don't know. what That's not going to stop it. These, these IDs didn't stop it. Nothing will stop it. No. Nothing's going to stop it if they want to. Yeah. It, you, if you have somebody that's willing to die for what they believe in, you're not going to stop them for doing whatever it is they want to do. Like Flight 93 did. I hope they play those tapes on the air so we can hear them. Cause they won't play them because they said there's nothing on the tapes. Oh. That's what they said. I didn't know that. That's what they said. So there's nothing on the tape. Nothing. They've got the flight recorders, and there's nothing on the tape. They said somebody turned them off. Well, I do know <laughs> it is possible, Bill. My brother flies, and they do have an erase button on there for, at the end of each flight, which they shouldn't have. 
Did you know that? The way those things are built, they're not supposed to be able to be erased by anybody. I know. And they're supposed to be taken out when you land by ground crew personnel and the tapes e either erase or, or new tapes put well, in. He told me they no don't... one on the plane is supposed to be able to turn them off well, or erase them or remove them or even get to them. Well, he told me they have switches in the cockpit, which they shouldn't have. Well, you know what? I, I have a tendency not to believe your brother or well, whoever it is. Huh? He's a pilot. I don't care if he's a pilot or not. I know I, pilots that lie every day. I know. I hope he's, <laughs> I hope he's wrong. I hope to God he's wrong. I hope he's wrong, too. I, I, I'm not saying that he's telling a lie. I'm just telling you that from what I... See, I used to be an aircraft mechanic in the, in the United States Air Force. Oh. I know about these things. Okay. At least back then, unless, unless it's changed, nobody aboard that plane is supposed to be able to get to them, to be able to even see them, or take them out, or touch them, or erase them, or turn them off, or in any other way uh, fool with them whatsoever. Maybe we'll have some new pilots call up and let us know what changes they've made in these planes. You never know what goes on. Maybe they have. Okay, thanks. I, I hope bye they bye. haven't, because the whole purpose of the thing is an emergency device to be able to record exactly what happens on board a plane in extremis is totally defeated if somebody can walk up and erase the tape or turn it off. What good are they? Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. Unless they've changed things considerably, uh, when I was in the Air Force, you couldn't do that on any plane, Air Force, military, or commercial jet. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. Thanks for the intelligence this evening. It's a great show. And uh, I'd like to say also, uh, I don't mean to seem crass or anything, but there's five thousand bodies down there. If that's the truth, and uh, disease and bacteria is going to come into play pretty soon, then I hear no one. Uh, I'm mentioning that on the air, and I just like to bring that up. Well, it's, I think it's pretty much common sense. It's going to start smelling. The smell of death is going to be all over New York City. Uh, yeah, there could be uh, diseases if any of those people had diseases. Otherwise, there probably won't be. But uh, you know, I think that's a matter of common sense. Yeah. Okay. I just and everybody involved with the rescue effort knows that, and you can see they're wearing protective clothing and taking uh, proper precautions. All right, Bill. I just want to bring it up for you. Thanks again for a great show. You're welcome. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight is the number. And uh, I got to tell you, once that smell starts wafting across New York City, you're going to see a lot of people stop going to work. It's a terrible, sickly, sweet smell. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, uh, Bill. I am a pilot, and there is a reason that you are able to disable that. And that's in case there is a short circuit. Uh, it's to, to prevent a fire in the aircraft. You have to pull the fuse, and that's how you're able to disable those recorders. So now they have made it so you can disable the very thing that are the only things that in the emergency that you might have to pull this fuse for, they would be able to tell what happened. Boy, that sure makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it does <laughs> prevent the aircraft from burning up in the sky, and that, that's... I guess that was that was considered a bigger threat than someone doing this. But again, no one, no one should be in that cockpit. I'll be honest with you. Had they armed those two pilots, that this would never have happened. No, if 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 people in the passenger compartment had been armed, it wouldn't have happened. Absolutely. In fact, the only the only, the only the only thing I would say though, Bill, is that people should be trained to realize you can't just fire off a weapon up in, a, in an aircraft that's at thirty thousand feet because the aircraft itself explode. More rapid decompression. Well, I'm I'm well aware of that. That that's why I would say limit it to the pilots because at least we would be trained as to how to you know use the proper ammunition that will not go through you know that will not go through the the bulkhead of the aircraft. Well, actually, I have to disagree. I think all Americans are entitled to defend themselves and they're entitled to keep and bear arms and any laws. Well, I agree, that... but the problem I have though is that well, you, you may have you may have a problem, but your problem is with the Constitution, not with me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bill. You're welcome. See, that's uh, that's what I don't like about all these people who don't understand anything about the Constitution. Anybody who has a reason of their own to disarm American citizens, it's okay to do it. The Constitution says we have a right to keep and bear arms. Good night, folks. God bless each and every single one of you. I've gone over my time. I'm probably off WBCQ. 